Who is the real Preston Sprinkle when it comes to Sodom and Gomorrah? What does he believe? What does he teach? Can we get a clear understanding of this topic? Can we understand the position he argues for, the way he's arguing for it, the way he's arguing against other people? What does he believe? This week, we're really diving into the beliefs and teachings of Preston much more directly than we have the previous two weeks, though it's building massively off of part one and part two. This one is going to be a doozy. Welcome to the Enemies Within the Church podcast. You can go to enemieswithinthechurch.com right now to view the documentary if you haven't already. Go ahead and buy a copy if you have. Buy several copies. Give them out to your friends. We want that information to be out there. It is still relevant. In fact, just as relevant as when the documentary was originally released. You can also go to ewtcnews.com. That stands for Enemies Within the Church News ewtcnews.com to view the continued project that this podcast is a part of. Welcome to the episode. I'm your host, Kyle Witt. And like I said, we're going to be getting into Preston Sprinkle's teachings on Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, if you're someone who is a fan of Preston, I'm glad you're here. I would love to hear your comments, your thoughts on this episode down in the description uh, down in the comments, whatever, wherever you're listening to this, let us know your thoughts. And please, if you are, you're a guest here. Keep an open mind. We're going to try and provide evidence. We want you to be able to verify. Now, if you're someone who is not a fan of Preston, well, you know, I'm glad you're here too. Uh, you're going to find this very interesting. We want both sides to be well informed though i think no matter your opinion on preston if you have not already looked into this if you have not already looked into preston's beliefs on sodom and gomorrah your opinion of preston is about to be significantly changed for me personally as this investigation has gone on and on i find myself constantly having the the thought have I been giving Preston too much credit? Now, that's enough building this up. Let us dive in. So the way we're going to be handling this, because Preston has legitimately over a thousand hours of content between books, podcasts, his podcasts, other podcasts, interviews, uh, lectures, written other written material, like what we're going to look at today. But this seems to be a very good starting point. Now, we're going to cross-reference it with a couple of his other works, but we're going to focus in because he, on his website, the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender, he commonly calls the Center. Uh, So from the Center, he has a pastoral paper that is on the topic of, was homosexuality the sin of Sodom? So we're going to go through this. We're going to look at it. Now, one of the things I'm going to be doing is if you are watching, if you are watching um, this uh, rather than simply just listening, uh, if you are unaware, this is available on YouTube, Rumble, Spotify, and any place you can get a podcast. But if you are watching, I'm going to have on the screen that pastoral paper. Uh, we're going to be going through it. Now, I'm not putting up, often in podcasting, you'll have the clean version. So just the the raw file itself up on the screen for people to look at. What I'm giving you is my, if yeah, if you're watching, you can see it. I'm giving you my edited version, my notes. So you're seeing highlights, you're seeing uh, notes on here. Um, you're even seeing things marked off, uh, specifically the one the points I want to bring up in this podcast. One of the reasons I want to do this is so you can look at the process for me analyzing this. You can see 
things being selected, things being noted, and understand that a podcast is just trimming it down to really get to it. But you can see that I'm not just skipping around. I am looking at the whole thing. I'm trying to condense it for time's sake. This, with the article, that is available on EWTCnews.com. This will be up there as well. You can you can look at this. You can look at my notes. I want to be as transparent as possible. One of the reasons I want to be as transparent as possible is because I do not believe, especially after uh, looking at last week's uh, you know, part two of this series, I think that's something that is not a characteristic of Preston. So I want to make this whole investigation as transparent as possible. Beyond that, I've been every week, the question we come up with for the week, I've been emailing that along with the podcast, along with the article to Preston. I want to be as transparent as possible with everything. Give him a chance to respond to things however he wants in whatever way he wants. I've made multiple offers. So clear, transparent, because I'm not telling you what to believe. I'm giving you the information so you can be informed. You can verify what I'm saying. Now, so as I said, this is pastoral paper, which the, the purpose of it is to be targeted at pastors predominantly. Um, though it is still for general consumption as well. And the topic is, or the question is, was homosexuality the sin of Sodom? That's not necessarily the best question because Preston's going to take that and kind of mold it into what he wants. It would be okay for someone who is not trying to reduce it, but Preston does reduce it. We'll see that. But let's jump in a little bit. So in responding to the idea that Christians read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19, 1 through 10, uh, he says that I will show that this interpretation that Sodom is about homosexuality, or at least it's the, the primary, the large sin on display, uh, I will show that this interpretation is not only wrongheaded, but pastorally destructive. As Christians today wrestle with whether same-sex sexual relations are morally permissible, Christians don't struggle with that. Um, we, we don't struggle with that. The Bible's made that clear. Uh, Non-affirming or traditional Christians should not use the story of Sodom as biblical evidence for their position. So it's a little bit of a bold claim to start off with. He, he's already establishing right here that he does not believe that Sodom and Gomorrah are, well, not just that they're not about homosexuality, but homosexuality is not a substantial factor in it. If it is a factor, it is not a substantial one. But let's let's continue on. So one of the things he does right off the bat, so we're still in the introduction. This is all the introduction. This is all the introduction. He muddies the waters. I'm going to say that. He mutters the waters right off the bat um, by saying things like this. But the word homosexuality is, ver is a very broad term that includes identity, orientation, lust, sexual intercourse, romantic desire, same-sex attraction, same-sex marriage, and so much more. Only some of the various aspects of homosexuality include sexual activity. Continuing on, reiterating this, many aspects of homosexuality don't even come close to playing a role in the story of Sodom. The story is clearly not about orientation, identity, marriage, or even same-sex attraction or romantic desire. Instead of asking, is the sin of Sodom homosexuality, we should ask a more precise question, is the sin of Sodom same-sex sexual behavior? So in his introduction, after he has a question that is, is leading this, this paper, he then says, oh, by the way, I'm going to throw that out the window and I'm going to replace it with something else. 
but then he's going to further replace it with something else. But then he's going to walk away from all of that as his paper goes on. But we see him distracting from the question immediately by saying, oh, well, homosexuality covers all these different things. Now, whether it does or doesn't, my contention would be that he's injecting and overly pulling, picking things apart. Uh, he's injecting meaning and defining every little nook and cranny he can into its own thing. But regardless of that, is that relevant? Is that relevant? Well, firstly, it's not relevant to the initial question. Was homosexuality the sin of Sodom? It's not relevant to that. Which is why he needs to, he's doing it. He, he's taking it away from a question and he's taking it to, to something else. It's a distraction. It's a, it, frankly, it's a little bit manipulative. But the thing we really should be asking is, does, does the Bible handle sin this way? Does the Bible handle sin the way that, that Preston is handling homosexuality? Does it pull apart every little potential nuance of it and then treat those as separate things? Or does it condemn whole categories? Well, obviously it condemns whole categories. That's that's the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are a summary of God's law. And you see him, that God doesn't have a problem summarizing. He also doesn't have a problem with going into the details, but he summarizes. And there's no way around God condemning you know, if, if Preston wants to nuance out all of those those individual things, well, it's irrelevant, again, because the Bible's condemned the whole thing. It's condemned that whole lot. So what's, what's the purpose of bringing this up? Well, let, let's continue on a little bit, because he, he then goes on to split, even among same-sex sexual activity, um, now, if I sometimes don't read the quotes exactly as they're written, there are certain words for the sake of YouTube, which can be very aggressive with its algorithm. I'm going to switch out. So instead of a certain word, I'm going to say forced, uh, forced relations. And I'm probably going to change. Sometimes he uses sodomite, and I think he's using it to try and reclaim the term. Uh, he's using it to refer to the people of Sodom. Um, because I'm just reading quotes, you won't have that context. So I'm likely going to say the people of Sodom for the sake of you uh, having clarity of what Preston's talking about in the quote without having to read the whole context. I do want you to go read the whole context at some point, though. But in same-sex sexual behavior, as he, as he says, he then splits it between uh, promiscuous sexual behavior and monogamous uh, sexual behavior within marriage. That's the context for this part. But I would still want to distinguish between the two, between promiscuous behavior and monogamous marriage. For various pastoral reasons, a gay person, or straight person for that matter, who has several sexual partners every week should be pastored differently than the sexually abstinent gay Christian man wait for this, engaged to another man foregoing sexual relations until his wedding night. He, he does this multiple times throughout this entire paper where he connects straight sexual behavior with homosexual behavior and then says basically says they're morally equivalent at their starting point. But are they morally equivalent at their starting? Preston does, claims he doesn't believe that. He claims to believe that homosexuality is condemned in the Bible. That the starting point between the two, that there's a correct expression of heterosexuality, but there is no correct expression of homosexuality. He claims to believe that, but then he says things like this, that creates a distinction that puts them on the... On, that puts homosexual and heterosexual behavior on the same level that there is 
is a state of neutrality that they both start from. But that's simply not the case. Homosexuality in all of its forms, no matter what it is, is, is condemned. The whole thing, blanket. So pastorally, there is not going to be a substantive difference between someone who's, who's gay and sleeping around and someone who is gay and engaged to another man. Both of those are activities that need to be ended immediately. Both of those are sexually promiscuous activities, sexually deviant behaviors. One is already acting upon it. The other is profaning marriage and has homosexual desire, homosexual lust. Uh, it is there. It can't not be. Uh, there is no co correct, correct expression of a desire for a, a man to desire another man. There's no correct expression of that. That immediately puts it in the category of an incorrect desire, a lust. So in this situation, both are partaking in a deviant behavior that needs to be ended immediately, not gradually over the period of time. Now we're not talking you end this literally the second you don't respond in, in one second, you're excommunicated. But if we learned anything from Corinthians, willfully living in a deviant uh, sexual behavior is worthy of church disciplining. So this is a, regardless of them, they're both church discipline situations. But let's continue on. But we should certainly distinguish between the types of wrongness under consideration and let the most relevant passages shape our pastoral wisdom. Again, he's creating this. He's saying, hey, if someone is being, quote, monogamous, you're not being biblically monogamous, but if they're being homosexually monogamous in a, in a homosexual marriage or even engagement, which is a huge distraction to pull, to put engagement in there, but it changes nothing, that that is a different level of wrongness, a lesser wrongness than just sleeping around. But how so? One of them involves repeated sexually immoral behavior. The other one involves sexually immoral behavior and profaning of marriage. The one he portrays as more innocent is just as sinful and actually more sinful. There are more different sins going on. It does not make it better that he's profaning marriage. So this is already getting off to a very strange foot. A very strange foot. Now, one of the things is, you know, we're skipping over a lot here because he's going to go through um, what, well, he, he's just establishing a few points that are, are just very irrelevant to the point we don't need to, to read them. He's responding to things that, you know, he's saying, oh, scholars that are for homosexuality. Well, I don't care what those scholars say. I care what Preston says. So let's continue on. Um, we do want to focus in on this. So in responding to what is going on in, in the, the story itself in Genesis 19, Preston's going to somewhat defend the traditional position. This is a common tactic. Start out building common ground. He's going after scholars who are pro-homosexuality. Now, this is his defense. He's defending the use of the word to know in uh, Genesis 19. He's defending that it means sex. So the Hebrew word yada, to know, almost certainly refers to sexual intercourse here. Further down, the men of Sodom were most likely trying to have sex with God's angels. But notice in there, both times, almost certainly and most likely, he's very much tempering something that doesn't need to be tempered. In the, you know, when a 
someone goes to a criminal trial and the verdict comes back, does the jury say almost certainly guilty, most likely guilty? No, they say guilty. Are they saying that it is an absolute 100% chance that he's guilty? No. They're saying the facts as presented are do not present a reasonable doubt as to the conclusion that he is guilty. The same can be applied here. Even if you don't have that perfect certainty, that 100% certainty, there is not a single fact that would cause us to doubt that they... Their, their intent. The, the context makes it even more clear. So it, it's strange. Why is he tempering that? Why is he tempering something unless he's saying it's not a beyond a reasonable doubt? Now, I say it is 100%. I see it so far beyond that that it is 100%. It's clear. But I'm just giving him a little bit of credit there just to point out that why is he tempering that it, it would indicate that he has a lesser degree of certainty than beyond a reasonable doubt. AKA, if this was a criminal trial, his conscience would lead him to say not guilty. That is the, that's my reading of it. That's my, what I can get based on the words used. It's strange is the point of what I'm saying, but we need to take note of those strange things because they start to build up and when they build up they start to create a picture and that picture can help us but let's continue on we'll be better equipped to understand how this story fits into our modern discussions about same-sex sexual behavior once we made four simple observations so th that's predominantly bringing up for the, for the sake of context what we're going to be going into he's going to bring up uh, four simple observations, but there's a weird, there's something I want to, I want us to make note of the, to understand how this story fits into our modern discussion about same sex sexual behavior. We've already noticed him put a very modernistic definition onto homosexuality, really pulling it apart into all sorts of, of diverse aspects. And then we see this here. He's setting something up. He's he's disconnecting the two. He's he's drawing a disconnect between the Bible and modern times. Pay attention to that. Pay attention to that. See if that's coming up as we go along through this. So, continuing on, he's he's going to start to establish a few things. Even though all uh, even though all the men were trying to have sex, most likely, or were trying. Again, there's, there's a language shift here that's worth noting. Uh, now, I, yeah, I think he's using the right language here. He's, he's saying it's in a certainty. But again, worth noting, why did the language shift when he was talking just a couple paragraphs ago? Even though all the men were trying to have sex with Lot's guest, it's unlikely that all the men were gay. Okay, this is a very strange sentence. Where is he going with this? In the ancient world, it wasn't uncommon for straight men to have forced relations with other men as an act of dominance and power. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. I'm going to ask I'm going to ask you the audience a question. When a man has sex with another man, what type of sex is that? Is that heterosexual? Or is that homosexual? Well, it's homosexual. So what he's saying here is that people are, ho are heterosexual despite engaging in homosexual activity. That it, it's someone's Again, this is why it's important to notice how he, he pulled those things apart, because they don't have the identity. They don't have the orientation. They don't have the so on and so forth. He's separating the actions. He's saying it's not the actions that define who someone is and what they believe, but it's, it's something else. It's 
well, I, it, I, I don't even know if he'd say identity because they wouldn't see it that sort of way. They wouldn't have these concepts that he's introducing. So it's, it's completely irrelevant because, I mean, what is that even supposed to mean? What is that even supposed to mean? Continuing on, and he's going to provide a little clarity on this. It's not an expression of attraction or, ori or orientation. It's an expression of dominance. But what does that change? That doesn't change anything. It doesn't matter uh, if someone has homosexual relations with someone else. It doesn't matter if they're doing it to express dominance or if they're doing it to express uh, attraction or orientation. Beyond that, those two wouldn't even be mutually exclusive. It, it, it's strange. Is he saying that the men didn't... Okay, this is going to be... This whole conversation is going to be weird. I'm just going to point this out. But is, is he saying that the men don't enjoy what they're doing? That they're doing it like something they don't enjoy as this like simply a ritual. Oh man, I, I don't like that I have to have forced relations with this other man. No one's making them do it. They're choosing to do this. They're doing it for a, a reason and they enjoy the reason that they're doing. Now, you, you, it doesn't matter if it's for pleasure or for uh, humiliation and domination. Doesn't matter. This is such a red herring. But we start to make conclusions. Preston's already making conclusions based off of not really saying anything yet, uh, or at least not making any argumentation besides simply making assertions. Um, clearly, then, Sodom wasn't condemned for simply being gay. That is, for experiencing attraction to the same sex. Someone can be gay and abstain from all forms of sexual activity, especially the type of activity pursued by the men and boys of Sodom. I don't care if someone is, quote, gay and they don't act on it. That doesn't change. That doesn't change Genesis 19. And that doesn't change the fact of that person's situation. There can be different degrees of severity, which is something that Preston's going to acknowledge throughout this. There can be different degrees of severity under the same sinful category. So just because someone is in a different level of severity within the same category doesn't mean that suddenly there is an acceptable portion of that category or that the, the more extreme end of the category is not relevant to the less extreme end of the category. But who... I've never heard... Well, I, okay, maybe I have. Maybe I have because I'm translating Preston's language into other people's language. But I haven't heard in the way that Preston's labeling this People say that Sodom was condemned simply for, quote, being gay and experiencing attraction to the same sex. All of the the um, commentary I've ever heard on it does involve acting upon it. And it's not simply they were they were gay. It was so much more than that. But Preston's trying to smash down. It's really funny. He's going to nuance his side of things, but he's smashing down and reducing the story. We need to get more context, though. We need to understand things. Now, if some of you think I might be being nitpicky on certain things, it's because we're seeing them build up over time through the paper. So stick with me. This leads to a second observation. The men of Sodom were trying to gang have forced relations. Lots guests. They weren't pursuing consensual sexual relations with Lot's guests, bringing them chocolate and flowers and asking their father's permission to court. What? <laughs> I uh, will continue on, but uh, every time I read that, I, I don't know where it's coming from. It's such a, a manipulative distraction and so weird. Um, there's nothing consensual going on in Genesis 19. 
although there is sexual activity being pursued, it's sexual violence rather than expression of consensual love. Such violence might have provoked fire from heaven, even if God, Lot's guests had been women. Okay, super important things to note here. He just said that the sin they were condemned of was attempted homosexual forced relations. <laughs> so to the initial question, he just answered yes. By speculating that God might have rained fire down uh, if it was uh, women instead. It's one of the dangers of being in um, in the position that Preston's in to try and argue from is you have to be very careful what you say because you might create contradictions. Now, the other thing with that is that's, I mean, I don't care might have. I don't care might have done that um, if they were attempting to, to do that to women. It's a horrifying thing. But we don't care about might haves. We care about what does the Bible say. So far, Preston has not been addressing God's word. He's been just pontificating, speculating, uh, putting his opinions out there, and poisoning the pool. He, he's poisoning the well with 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 all of this, rather than just going to God's word. What does God's word say? Beyond that, all this stuff. I mean, there's so much flowery language. Uh, I mean, literally bring them chocolate and flowers, asking their provide. It doesn't, none of that matters. None of that matters. None of that matters to any of the questions that he established. Now, I'm not sure what his point and purpose in this paper is because he did establish multiple different questions, but he hasn't been sticking to them either. But this is, this is all irrelevant because the question is, what, what is up with Sodom? What is going on with Sodom? Why did God rain fire on Sodom? And he's not addressing that. And he's not addressing anything really yet. Let's continue on. Let's see if he gets into it. And he will. He will. Uh, the question facing the church today is whether two people of the same sex can engage in consensual sexual relations in the context of a lifelong union. The story of Sodom doesn't address this question. It only shows that gang-forced relations is wrong. Again, he, he acknowledged that there was attempted homosexual forced relations. I'm sorry I have to say it like that. YouTube apparently is pretty aggressive about that word. Uh, and though I don't really care about YouTube's guidelines, I don't want to unnecessarily get this episode shut down. Yeah, so, so where is that a, a, a question in the church today? Not in biblically-centered churches. So again, it's just one of those random distractions, but it's establishing something. He's trying to frame this as a, a more complex question. That there's a bigger question going on that the church is wrestling with. And it's a question of affirming versus unaffirming. That's, that's really weird. Why is he... Honest question. I'm, I want to hear your thoughts on this. Give me your thoughts. If you didn't have the context of who Preston Sprinkle was, and you heard some, some of these quotes, like specifically that quote right there, uh, the question facing the church today is whether two people of the same sex can engage in consensual sexual relations in the context of a lifelong union. The story of Sodom doesn't address this question. It only shows that gang force relations is wrong. If you just had those kind of quotes, what would you think Preston's beliefs were? Now, you know, listen to some of the other quotes in here and, and give me your thoughts on that. Because to me, it honestly sounds like he's arguing for affirming homosexual marriage. Which is strange because he's also, he's, this is why we ask the question, who is the real Preston Sprinkle? Because it becomes very confusing. Continuing on. We can't actually say they were condemned for sexual activity in Genesis 19 because there was no sexual activity. 
So one of the things, that's why he reframed the question. One of the reasons he reframed the question, even though he's not really going to rest on that reframed question. But it's one of the reasons he did that. Beyond that, hasn't he already said, I mean, if you're looking at this, you can see how close this is. It only shows that gang force relations is wrong. We can't actually say they were condemned for the sexual activity in Genesis 19 because there was no sexual activity. So does it show that sexual activity is wrong? Or does it not show that? And you can see, we are a paragraph, the next paragraph, from him saying that it showed that uh that a, a type of sexual activity was wrong and then he immediately says well we can't say that will the pre real preston sprinkle please stand up who are you but continuing on there is no evidence though that consensual same-sex relations were among these immoral practices among the moral practices uh of sodom he's just walking in a completely direct different direction walking in a completely different direction but let's continue on uh because he's going to keep really building on things so fourth now to be clear we already went through three of his points fourth uh, other biblical passage, other Bible passages refer back to the story of Sodom, but never mention same-sex sexual behavior. Do they now, or don't they now? Is that true? Isaiah, for instance, mentions Sodom in the context of false religion and social injustices. Isaiah 1, 10 through 17, 3 through uh, 3, verse 9. Jeremiah mentions the same and adds adultery to the list. And there's no evidence that the adultery Jeremiah has in mind was men sleeping with another woman's husband, Jeremiah 23, 14. There's weird things already going on in this, but Jesus mentions Sodom without ever hinting at the at same-sex relations, Matthew eleven twenty three 23 through 24. Okay. Isaiah, Isaiah 1 and 3, I mean, Isaiah just the whole thing, but Isaiah isn't about Sodom and Gomorrah, it's about Israel. Those, those passages he mentioned, and you know, we're already pretty far in, that's why I'm not reading all the passages, but they're about Israel. They're not about Sodom and Gomorrah. He's listing Israel's sins. He's listing sins of Israel and saying, you guys are as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not saying, here is Sodom and Gomorrah's sins. That's saying, here are your sins. And then saying, Sodom and Gomorrah, cities that are known as just an example of debauchery. You're as bad as them. It's called an analogy. And the same thing with Jeremiah. It's not about Sodom and Gomorrah. It's about wicked prophets being destroyed like... Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Again, analogies. Same thing with Matthew. We got more about judgment. Sodom and Gomorrah is often used to refer to what? To judgment. Because it's an example of what? Of judgment. None of these are commentary on what that judgment was for in a specific sense. Analogies are useful things, but you have to understand when it's an analogy. So, then he goes to the, quote, one passage that defines uh, the, the citizens of Sodom's sin. Uh, let's read it. Ezekiel 16, 49. Now, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. The... Oh, oh, we just kind of stopped mid-thought. Hmm. Feels like that—that's like continuation of something, and we're we're about to say something else. 
could it be that verse 50 is relevant to this discussion? Well, yes, it is. And Preston will admit that later. Why doesn't he admit that now? Because he's hooking you in with his ideas first. And then, you know, his fourth point here is really when he finally starts addressing things. But why did it take him this long? Well, he wanted to get you he wanted to t- tackle certain things first. He wanted to get you uh, into his definitions, into his box, and then present the information. And if he can get you to stay within his box and not look outside of it, then the argumentation is much easier. So let's, in response to Ezekiel 1649, he says, the one passage that actually defines uh, the sodomite sin uh, says that they were overstuffed, greedy people who were unconcerned for the poor. How ironic that some Christians have wielded the story of Sodom to condemn gay people while committing the very sins that the Bible calls sodomy. Oh my. That's, that's an accusation. So as we've gone through this, if you have not watched the episode on the 3D strategy, deny, deflect, discredit. We've talked about that in the previous parts already, but we've seen him throughout this. We've seen him deny, uh, we've seen him deflect, but now we have discredit. When he comes across the first passage that is difficult, he doesn't quote the full passage, he doesn't quote verse 50, and he immediately attacks people. How ironic that some Christians have wielded the story of Sodom to condemn gay people while committing the very sins that the Bible calls sodomy. So apparently you can't, if you condemn, here's the implication, the the functional implication of what he said. By putting two things next to each other and then not defining what he means, he's connecting those two thoughts. He's connecting condemning gay people with committing um, sins uh, like arrogance, uh, being unconcerned, not caring for the the needy, the poor. If you condemn homosexuality, then you are committing Sodom's sin. That is functionally what he has said there. Could you think about this? If you're reading this and you're someone who is not at a definite position, you're at a weaker foundation, you're trying to understand what the story is about, you stumble upon this and he starts to hit you with things like that, if you're already, again, you're already in his box, well, you're vulnerable to go, oh, well, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be a mean person. He's taking advantage of people's kindness by being mean. Anyway, the story of Sodom was, or if... If the story of Sodom was about homosexuality, we would expect other scripture references to confirm this, but they don't, says who? Says who? He hasn't addressed scripture references that do. Uh, Sodom and homosexuality are simply not correlated in any other biblical, uh, by any other biblical writer. I mean, there's only one biblical writer. He just happened to use multiple authors, but just one author. I I point that out because that's important. You know, it is God's word, not a a disconnected series of books. You can't take it so disjointedly. But it it really reminds me of, you know, I put this note here, but it reminds me of Muslims saying, you know, where did Jesus say I am God? Where did Jesus say I am God? He never said it. You cannot find it in the Bible. Yeah, he didn't say those three words, I am God, but he said very clearly that he is God over and over, both in word and deed, and arguably clear. But they reduce it down to, well, because he didn't say those three words, I am God, that he didn't claim it at all. It's dishonest argumentation, but that really comes down to what Preston is doing. He's saying, well... It, there's no biblical passage that uh, connects it to homosexuality in the way that I demand. Therefore, it didn't happen. 
even though, again, he hasn't even addressed the main passages that people would go to. He's going to, but let's continue on. First, he has to even more, uh, he has to taint things even more with an analogy, a really bad analogy, but let's read it. If a castaway were stranded on a desert island and the story of Sodom washed up on the shore, bad analogy already. Just the story of Sodom, you cannot have it. It's in the context of God's word. Washed up on shore, stuffed in a bottle, of course, the castaway would probably not conclude after reading the story that it prohibited same-sex marriage, same-sex romance, uh, romantic desire, or simply being gay. Now, 99% of people, 99% plus throughout history would not have those categories. Even in societies such as the ancient Greco-Roman world, which had what we would now call homosexuality, transgenderism, etc., they still wouldn't have these categories. This is something that uh, Preston has admitted as well throughout this, this, uh, this paper. We didn't look at that part, but uh, he does admit that they had different categories. Um, the story only addresses one type of attempted same-sex sexual activity, violent forced relations, as a display of power, most probably by heterosexual men. Again, if, if they're doing homosexual, committing homosexual acts, then they're not heterosexual. But the, he is just infused with this idea of fixed orientation, which is very strange because he says you can then act against your fixed orientation. Why doesn't he apply that in the reverse, though? Why doesn't he say, oh, well, if you have this, quote, gay orientation, then you can deny that and pursue marriage? You think he'd, he'd push that? No, he's pushing it the other way. Um, but he didn't do anything to prove where, where did he prove, where did he prove that they did it as a display of power and where would beyond that, he, he put that in there purely as speculation based on, uh, habits of the day and age, which he didn't even prove that either. He just stated it now, spoiler, that is something that would happen, but again, they weren't, it wasn't happening by heterosexual men especially not the way we would define it nowadays it was not a simply a display of dominance it's more complex than that you have to then prove that that was happening specifically in sodom but where is this hypothetical like this hypothetical person is preston he presents himself on a beach now if the whole bible washed up and they read the whole Bible, and they read it through multiple times, and then you ask them, which is a fair way to do it, because it's a story in the context of a larger narrative, the entire Bible. Then you go and ask them, do you believe that that person is going to give you this type of response that Preston's laying out here? Do you believe that person's going to say it's not about same-sex marriage, not about same-sex uh, romantic desire, or simply being gay, and that it's about... Um, violent forced relations as a display of power by heterosexual men. Again, if you're someone who agrees with Preston on things, please realize how this is not that that that's bad argumentation, that's manipulative. But seriously Preston, knock it off. I was expecting to go into this getting a an actual argument. Now, you can see the title of this section, Reasons Why Christians Uphold the Homosexual View. <laughs> uh, so one thing I want to point out right here is just, he says that most believe, uh, believe it, believe that Sodom and Gomorrah is about homosexuality. They believe it out of tradition. They haven't actually considered our observations above. So simply because you haven't considered Preston's novel interpretations, and you can look at history, they are novel, they are new. Um, just because people haven't, quote, considered those things does not mean that they're believing it simply out of tradition. I don't believe that that's why 
uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is about homosexuality or that's it's big primary sin. I don't believe it because of tradition. I believe it because I read God's word. Now you can, again, you, you want to let me know, answer in the comments. Do you believe it simply out of tradition or would you disagree with Preston's analysis of you there? Most is doing a lot of work there. So, he's going to go into, he's now arguing against uh, people who say that it is uh, homosexuality. So he says that in each case, we'll show why these arguments, the arguments that he's about to display, don't prove that all types of same-sex sexual behavior are in view in, in Sodom and Gomorrah, and they certainly don't show that every aspect of homosexuality is being condemned. Again, this is because this this is why he had to split it up into so many things. He had to split it up into all these different categories, so then he can say, "Well, see, it's not condemning this specific detail or this specific detail." And since I, as Preston, have decided these are different things, therefore, it's. Uh, Again, that's not, you have to go with what the Bible says. How does the Bible handle it? Does the Bible subcategorize it the way you do? Does the Bible? He's arguing. Now, some people might take this as a little bit offensive. Um, I'll stand by my statement, though, but he's arguing like an evolutionist. He's arguing like an evolutionist. He's starting with the end result and his interpretation of that end result and then trying to force it in reverse back to an origin point you can't argue like that you have to start from the source and correctly interpret it put it in its context and see where does it lead the same way that evolution falls apart when you start at origin and you move forward preston's logic falls apart when you start from the bible and try and get to his categories. The categories are not there. The subdivisions aren't there. The whole thing is tackled as a whole. Now, he's going to go into the, the Jewish interpretation. I don't care. I don't care about the Jewish interpretation. I care about the biblical interpretation. I care what the Bible says. He, it's also quite a bit of selective... He's just kind of picking and choosing here. So we're mainly skipping over this. I do want to say this, though. Um, he says that some say that the first century Jews believed the sin of Sodom to be uh, same-sex sexual behavior without distinguishing between different kinds of behavior. And he's got to throw that in there. And therefore, early Christians assumed uh, this same interpretation. So he's saying some say this, and then from that, they assume, but the problem is you can go read early church fathers. They connected, you know, right in the, the second, third, fourth century, they're immediately connecting it to homosexuality. It's right off the bat. There's not a development. They're, they're connecting it. Um, they didn't get that from the, the, the Jewish context. They got it from the bible that's what they're arguing from it's what they're commenting on so this is such a a manipulative thing to say but um uh, skipping on down now he's actually going to start to handle verses that do talk about it so he's going to handle jude verse six and seven um he's going to start off with a little bit of a deceptive thing here Depending on your translation, Jude 6 and 7 may look, depending, may. He's poisoning the well. Just state state it. If you're going to state an argument, and as we saw last week, Preston, you claim to try and steal man, or as you say, steal person, an argument to present the strong version of that argument, not the false, the weak, the straw man, but to present the steel man. How is that presenting a steel man? If you want to present the steel man, then give us the robustness. Don't don't immediately uh, try and get people to be like, oh, well, am I reading the right translation? Am I just believing this because of a translation? 
Depending on your translation, Jude 6 or 7 may look like uh, a reference to same-sex sexual behavior in Sodom. Now, the relevant section is, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer punishment of eternal fire. And that, he used the NIV. Now he's going to jump into um, the Greek, which fine, jump from, don't use translations. Why even bring up translations? Just go to the Greek if you're going to go to the Greek. Uh, the Greek phrase, uh, sarkos heteros, uh, which literally means other flesh. Some readers assume that the this other flesh, please pay attention to this. Some readers assume that this other flesh means same sex sexual activity. Ironically, the second Greek word heteros is where we get the first part of our compound word homosexuality. That is one of the most manipulative things. I'm sorry, this frustrates me massively because that is one of the most manipulative things i have seen in a very long time in the context of uh christianity in the context of doing the research that that i do here at emmys within the church so manipulative has nothing to do with what's going on it does not matter there are thousands thousands of greek roots in English. And that's probably a, a huge underestimation. It, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. Many, 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 many of our words come from Greek roots. That is not how etymology is done. You do not look at the, the etymology of a word in just in its origin, the, the word from another language that is part of this current word and go, therefore, no, you look at the definition of it. And yes, etymologies, origins of a word are useful. You can learn a lot through that, but you need to know what the word means. You cannot just go, here's a constituent component of this word. Therefore, these two ideas are connected. No. No, that's not how this works. <laughs> that, that is such a manipulative distraction. But let's continue on. Let's see the rest of his argument on this idea of other flesh. Uh, the sexual immorality of the uh, men of Sodom, Sodomites, had to do with going after other flesh and quite plainly not the same flesh. This is why he brought up that manipulative, uh, oh, heterosexuality not the same flesh. To interpret other flesh as a combination of same-sex sexual activity goes directly against what the Greek actually says. How? How? You have not established that. You connected it to heterosexuality, and you're now saying, without arguing for it, that it goes against what the Greek says. How? If Jude had same-sex intercourse in view, he most likely would have said same flesh rather than other flesh no no he wouldn't no he wouldn't before i make more comment on that just keep that in mind let's read the very next section uh where he talks about jude um he talks about jude in verse six uh in light of verse six it seems rather clear that the other flesh of jude seven refers to the angels uh that the sodomites were trying to have sex with. Why does he say this? Because in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, where angels had sex with humans, Jude 7 then connects this story with the story of Sodom, where the men of the city were trying to have sex with angels, which Jude describes as other flesh. In short, Jude 6 and 7 offers no evidence that the sin of Sodom was same-sex sexual behavior of any kind. He didn't even address the arguments that people make. He didn't address anything. He made a bunch of statements, and they are beyond ridiculous and manipulative. It's incredibly frustrating. If you're not seeing why we're doing a series on Preston, why we're asking who's the real Preston, I hope you're starting to understand. But this is where it really starts to come into play because. So 
what is he going off there? He's going off the idea that whether you believe this or not, it's relevant. We're going to grant it to him right now. That in Genesis uh, chapter six, angels came down to earth, had sex with uh, with women. They produced offspring. Those were the, the Nephilim, a race of angel-human hybrids. Again, whether you believe that's what Genesis 6 is talking about or not, set that aside. We're just going to say, yes, that's what it's talking about for right now. We're going to grant it to Preston. And we're going to continue on. So he's saying that other flesh, since Jude referenced angels not observing their, their proper place, which there's debate even among people who believe in the Nephilim interpretation of Genesis 6, uh, the angel interpretation there, there's still debate that Jude 6 is specifically referencing that. But, so, you know, we want to go to the same level as Preston was going to, we'll pull out the maybes, the mites, but there really is serious debate about this because it's not directly connected. But let's grin. Let's say, for right now, because we're going to steel man this. Let's say that Genesis 6 is talking about angels that came down to earth, had sex with women, and that that is what Jude is talking about. And then he goes into uh, verse 7. The problem is, the biggest problem is, one, what did the men of Sodom know? What they said to Lot is, where are the angels no they said where are the men who came to you tonight bring them out to us that we may have relations with them the men of sodom said you have men in there not angels you have men and we want them so they didn't even know they didn't even know beyond that in genesis 6 that would be angels leaving their proper place and pursuing relations with uh humans in this it would be the men pursuing the angels it's the opposite so we're talking about a again a complete 180 which does change the idea but the men in sodom thought they were they were men they didn't think they were angels Beyond that, the whole idea of other flesh, meaning, well, then it would have to be opposite sex, is an absurd argument because it's going off of, I mean, it really is connected. It, it relies on that idea that, oh, well, uh, heteros means heterosexual. But that's not the case. What is other flesh? I mean, go read Romans, go read Romans 1. It describes, does it describe pursuing opposite sex relations as as strange as aberrant as as other no it describes same sex relation as that way just because it's same sex they didn't say that that's a modern term he's injecting a modern term into the ancient context the reality is the other that's being talked about is other than the proper flesh the proper flesh for humans is man and woman the so to pursue other flesh other than what is uh normal to pursue strange flesh a synonym of other hence why it's used in many translations strange flesh um the that's the two primary ones is other flesh or strange flesh is because it's strange to what is natural. It's other than what is natural. Preston's not addressing that, though. He's not addressing... That's the argument. Preston's not addressing that. He's using manipulation instead. Continuing on. Now he's going to address... He's finally bringing up Ezekiel verse 50, where Ezekiel talks about Sodom after he said... Well, let's read verse 49, 50. Behold... This was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty and did an abomination before me, so I removed them when I saw it. Now, 
let's just read. We're going to read a lot of what Preston says here quickly and then talk about it. But Preston's argument from that, the way he tries to get around it is to say, um, some argue that the word abomination uh, refers to same-sex intercourse based on the occurrence of this very same word in Leviticus 18, 22, and 2013. The Old Testament passage that prohibit male same-sex sexual behavior. This argument is strengthened by the fact that Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13 are the only two passages in Leviticus where abomination occurs in the singular. Um, he then continues on. It assumes that the reader will hear an abomination, and immediately jump to Leviticus 18, 22, and 2013, and then map these passages and the singular and abomination onto Genesis 19. That's a lot of dancing around required for a reader. But is he addressing... Now, that, that sounds technical. Talking about, oh, well, the, the words and the singular and the blah, blah, blah. Okay, first thing, if that argument of it being singular is a valid argument, then it's irrelevant um, what someone what thinks and how they get to that. They jump around. It doesn't matter. If it is a correct argument, it's a correct argument. I think it's a completely irrelevant argument. There, there is some use to it. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is it's small potatoes when you got the big thing over here. Why are we connecting abomination in Ezekiel 50 to abomination in Leviticus 18, 22, and 2013? Because of the context. Ezekiel is referencing back to a situation where, yes, there are many sins going on, and Ezekiel lists this chain of sins, and it leads to the abomination. Why are we connecting that to Leviticus 18, 22, and 2013? Because the story involved, as Preston's admitted, as Preston has admitted, it involved homosexual activity. Or to be, you know, devil's advocate to Preston, attempted. We'll address that whole attempted thing right now. So continuing on. Lastly, Ezekiel said they did an abomination and yet no one had same-sex intercourse in the story of Sodom. They tried to uh, gang force relations Lot's guests, but the Sodomites were struck blind before they ma making it to first base. Uh, we simply don't know exactly what Ezekiel had in mind when he said that the city of Sodom did an abomination. He may have had in some type of same-sex sexual activity in mind, but if he did... He was probably referring to the attempted forced relations. Um, th th there's issues here. There's lots of issues. One thing I want to point out is Preston's ignoring, and this is very, I'm going to make this argument. We're probably going to have to talk about it later, though, uh, in later installments, but Preston absolutely has to deny the existence of, uh, well, looks at a woman with lust, committed adultery in your heart. He has to deny uh, heart sin. He has to deny mental sin. He he says he acknowledges those, but in a situation like this, he has to deny it. What were they doing? They were intending, desiring to carry out this action by God's standard. God, God, in his word, he doesn't draw these distinctions. He says, if you intend to do it, you try and do this thing, it's as bad as if you did it. Now, one of them has greater consequence because it has impact on others. It is an actualization of it that is worse, but you still committed that sin. You still committed the sin. They, in God's eyes, have already committed, this, uh, committed sexual sin. So it's an absurd argument to say, well, because they didn't actually do it yet, it doesn't count. Does, the Bible doesn't see it that way. The Bible does not make this distinction. Beyond that, um, 
if his second part, this this seems a little bit subtle, but you have to get it. Um, we simply don't know exactly what Ezekiel had in mind when he said the city of Sodom did an abomination. If we if we can't know that, if that's an impossible thing to know, then God's failed as a communicator. Uh, if he's failed, then he's not all knowing. He's not all powerful. He's no longer God. You're still dead in your sins. That sounds a little extreme, but if you're going to question the Bible in the way that Preston just did, that's the consequence. Now, I've already said there are debate on things. Yes, we look at certain passages and we debate uh, extra details of it. In Jude, is it specifically referring back to uh, Genesis 6 or is it referring to something else? We know it's referring to to something. We know the context. We just have some additional questions. Now, I think it's a resolvable thing. And I think Genesis 6 is resolvable. I think the questions there are come more from people um, wanting to debate rather than letting God's word speak. But the point is to say that, oh, we just can't know especially on something where it it's presented in a way that you're supposed to understand what's said, then that's attacking God as a communicator. Hey guys, I know this is going long. Uh, I hope it's useful though. This is, this is really is where the rubber meets the road and we are almost done, but this is, this is probably the most important paragraph that we're going to read. Stick with me on this. Now, if the men of Sodom had actually had forced relations with Lot's guests, angels appearing as men, they would have violated Leviticus 18, 22, and 2013. Same-sex forced relations is a type of sexual activity. In the same way, this is going to get gross, guys. If a father rapes his five-year-old son, he too would be guilty of a type of same-sex sexual sin. But to condemn the father's act is not in itself to condemn all forms of same-sex sexual activity. Likewise, if a father rapes, uh, if a father has forced relations with his daughter and we condemn it, we are thereby not condemning all forms of opposite sex sexual behavior. The men of Sodom tried to have forced relations with Lot's visitors and there are piles of wickedness involved in the act. Pride, greed, lust, coercion, violence, sex outside of marriage, abuse, inhospitality, selfishness, lack of control, forced relations, and same-sex uh, sexual behavior. But to single out the latter categorically and reduce the story to a single narrative about homosexuality or being gay or same-sex love uh, collapses the multifaceted dimensions of homosexuality into a narrow theme of sexual violence. Not only is this reduction exegetically misleading it's pastorally destructive okay many many points i hope you can already see a lot of problems with that but there is no we've already talked about this there's no correct expression of homosexuality there is a correct expression of quote heterosexuality i don't like the word heterosexuality if you can't tell um i think it distracts from how the Bible handles marriage and sexuality and the fact that the Bible does not separate those as two distinct things. Um, but there's no correct expression of homosexuality, but there is a correct expression of heterosexuality. So yeah, both on the, the homosexuality side, it's already all condemned. He's kind of working backwards. He's looking at a specific example and then working backwards. No, look at the condemnation of all homosexual activity. Then you provide an example and you go, and that fits in that category. But you look at the second one and you go, well, this is this fits into a category, but it's not the correct category because the correct category is a different one. Even though by our modern standards, they're both heterosexual. But the, the correct sexual expression is in the context of marriage. I mean, you, you want to put it into modern terms, it'd be like spousal sexuality. Uh, that's where you're, that's the only correct sexual expression. 
So obviously what the, the father's done is wrong and you can condemn the whole category. What is the category? Well, the category is, well, I mean, there's multiple categories in there, but the, the category is fornication. There we go. <laughs> so again, it's just a massive distraction. And they did violate, again, they did violate Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. They just didn't have the chance to finish the violate, to finish acting it out. It's sort of like um, if someone, goodness gracious, if someone's trying to have forced relations with someone, you know, they corner a woman in an alleyway, um, they're, you know, they're, they're assaulting her, um, they don't actually get to the act itself, but they've got her in a state of undress. They're they're in the process of attempting, um, and someone stops. You know, someone does the right thing, steps in and stops them. Uh, you know, good thing, do that. Uh, are they? What, they're still going to be charged with. What are they going to be charged with? Attempted forced relations. Yeah, it's a slightly different label on it, but it's still under the same general category. Beyond this, we see him, it's complete straw man, because he's like, oh, well, look at this. There's piles of wickedness going on here. There's pride, greed, lust, coercion, violence, sex outside of marriage, abuse, inhospitality, selfishness, lack of control, forced relations, and same-sex sexual behavior. Now, many of those apply to the same categories. So he's splitting things apart again. But no one, no one says that there was only one sin committed in Sodom. In fact, it's the, the opposite. If you're reading it biblically, you go, hey, the, the, the biggest comparable thing we have to Sodom and Gomorrah is the flood, where the wickedness was so great. It's a chain of sin. I mean, he basically lays it out for us, a chain of sin that then leads to an even worse place. Go read Romans. Go read Romans 1. You see the degradation, and you see the progression, and worse and worse, and then one of the worst expressions of a society that's given over to, to uh, sin so fully is homosexuality. Another huge one is murder, murder of children. What do we see in our society now? This is why we got to get the story right. This is why we got to get the story right and not let people like this just manipulate. Never argue for a position, just manipulatively try and poke holes without ever addressing the real arguments and then say it's destructive, destructive to hold the view. Well, I'm sorry. How is it destructive? The rest of the Bible is just as clear. If the rest of the Bible is just as clear. Then how is it destructive? But let's see. He's going to give us a couple examples of how it's destructive. We're going to, I was going to read the article. The article will cover a couple other things he says in other places. We're not going to go into that anymore because this has gone longer than I thought, but we're going to look at a couple examples of how he says it's destructive. Um, and I will be generous. I'm not even going to read everything that I wanted to, but let, let's read this. So He's talking about the pastoral implications. He's given us a, a few different, um, well, three different implications. Uh, second, how we interpret the story of Sodom affects the church's reputation. Many non-believers reduce the Christian view of homosexuality to the story of Sodom. I, you know, frankly, I, I guess this is something grown up in the Pacific Northwest in the greater Seattle area. Uh, most non-Christians do no diddly squat about Sodom or they know is super, you know, just a ridiculous caricature of it. If they grew up in the church, they, it's not even a guarantee they know it then they might know again, a caricature of it. Um, that that's just a distraction. They don't care. They, you know, in, in interacting with people in homosexuality, I've never had one of them go to, well, your view of homosexuality is Sodom and Gomorrah. I never had that come up. They're perfectly willing to hate us for our views without having to go to Sodom. And since when is the church, you know, we, we stand, our doctrine stands on 
truth and what the Bible says, it doesn't stand on reputation. The church's reputation is built by its adherence to God's truth, not by its view of Sodom and Gomorrah. Like, like we don't change our view of this story because it would, quote, improve our reputation. Uh, continuing on, if the Sodomites, if the people of Sodom uh, are believed to be gay people and the Christian God went out of his way to destroy the city of Sodom, then the natural conclusion is that the Christian God hates gay people and can't wait to fire up the nukes and annihilate every gay on the planet. I mean, talk about fear-mongering, talk about just sensationalist nonsense. Again, if you read this, comment. If you read this without knowing who Preston is, would you say this is someone who is affirming of homosexuality or uh, affirming of the biblical view of marriage and sexuality? <laughs> but beyond that, God destroyed the city. He destroyed the city. You can't get around the fact that he destroyed the city. So if he destroyed the city, what did he destroy it for? If the message to the world is, oh, hey, guys, if you're just kind of, you know, because Preston tries to reduce it, he reduces it down to her, you know, oh, well, the, these other things like pride are so big. Well, then shouldn't God be raining fire on the United States? I, you, you don't get around that. You don't get around the judgment. And what are people going to be afraid of? They're not going to be afraid that he specifically annihilated his city for homosexuality, which it wasn't just homosexuality. Again, Preston's reducing that. He's trying to make the argument more difficult by claiming this all or nothing thing. But that was the, the kind of final expression of their uh, rebellion. But the judgment remains. So our God loves all people we are all equally in need of God's redeeming grace. Simply not true. Simply not true. Once you are saved, you are in a different category than those who are unsaved. Yeah, those who are saved, we need God's redeeming grace in one way, and we all need it in that same way. But if you're outside of God, yeah, all those people need God's redeeming grace, but in a different way. They're unsaved. There is a, one has been justified, which is what the people outside of Christ need. The other are being sanctified. Categorically different. Categorically different. Don't smash those two together. That's weird. Um, third, and most importantly, many people struggling with same-sex attraction are confused and damaged when Christians apply the story of Sodom to them. Okay, first, before we continue on this really bad analogy, then what do you do with the rest of the Bible? That makes it just as clear. It's just as, quote, harsh in its condemnation of homosexuality. What do you do with that? It doesn't... The biblical view of homosexuality doesn't rise or fall on Sodom and Gomorrah and doesn't get worse or, quote, nicer based on Sodom and Gomorrah. Continuing on, young Johnny comes out to his youth pastor when he is 15 years old, and his youth pastor shows him the story of Sodom and says, you know, Johnny, God doesn't approve of homosexuality. Johnny turns to read a passage about a bunch of men trying to have forced relations with a couple of angels and thinks, what do you think, I'm some kind of monster? Johnny begins to see the Christian Bible as twisted and condescending, and he tends to see Christians who read this Bible as unwilling to understand the real experiences of actual gay people, the ones who aren't down with forced relations with angels. So, right off the bat, well, one thing I find fascinating, absolutely fascinating, about this this analogy is the youth pastor didn't even say anything very extreme he just said god doesn't approve of homosexuality like isn't that something that preston believes who's the real preston sprinkle that's not 
that's that's very mild and it's very true and johnny johnny's response to it preston's making an argument based on his contrived example based on a bad reaction based on someone that what is rejecting christ it's not rejecting the pastor it's nothing that the pastor didn't make him walk away from church pastor didn't make him hate the bible pastor didn't make him reject christ that was where he was already at and that's the decision that he made johnny is bringing condemnation on himself he will stand before christ at the end of the age not johnny's pastor johnny will go to hell forever based on rejecting christ unless he turns and repents and submits to christ he's gonna he's gonna go to hell forever and that's not the pastor's fault that's johnny's fault that's johnny's responsibility it's just manipulative we have to speak the truth speak the truth in love but we have to speak the truth we can't just reinvent things and yeah we have to say you know johnny god doesn't approve of homosexuality again you don't need the story of sodom for that he could gone to leviticus he could have gone to romans he could have gone uh to the gospels he gone to many many places where it's made clear that homosexuality isn't god's design and the same message would apply and johnny's response would likely not be different doesn't fall rest and fall on sodom so why are you just trying to attack sodom it seems like there's some type of ulterior motive but i don't know what it is the type of same-sex sexual behavior pursued by the sodomites the people of sodom in genesis 19 does not reflect the attractions this is the end of the 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 whole paper so listen to this um does not reflect the attractions and experiences of the average gay person in the world today pastorally it's pastorally destructive to imply that it does whenever christians haphazardly correlate sodom with homosexuality an umbrella concept that includes orientation identity romance sexual activity marriage and more they unintentionally dehumanize gay people uh, with inaccurate accusations you don't need sodom to get that the bible doesn't have those categories you're putting your modern definitions into the bible and then saying well the bible didn't mention these this is the whole thing is preston's speculation it's just a i was expecting arguments to be made i was expecting things to be actually pulled apart more but this really was let me speculate and force my position and be manipulative and not even represent the the opposing views not go to the whole context of things but just assert things and fear monger and be sensational he's doing everything he claims that conservative christians do who is the real preston sprinkle i don't know but i'm starting to get a picture that he is right when he said about jared moore that there is a fundamentally different brand of christianity at play so the question for this week is you know i don't know how to turn this this one into as easy of a question i've been thinking about this i don't i didn't know how to turn this one into as easy as a question because it seems more like a discussion it seems more like a discussion because it's so all over the place it contradicts itself but the question that i'm going to put on it is to kind of ignore some of the other things and say preston if sodom wasn't in the bible would the bible's condemnation of homosexuality be just as clear does the bible's condemnation of homosexuality rest or fall on sodom thus would it change what that pastor said to little johnny and would johnny's response change it all again i love to hear your thoughts on this episode i know this was a little bit of a longer one but we really got into things and i think you can see that <sighs> 
Preston is representing a different brand of a fundamentally different brand of Christianity, as he says, as he's claimed. And I don't know exactly what it is, but it definitely is not. It's not as near as I was giving him credit for. It's much further away than I thought before I went down the road of asking the question of who the real Preston Sprinkle is. But I hope that this episode was useful. I hope it was helpful. If it was, please interact with it some way. Uh, not that we need you know everything to grow, numbers go up, but uh, that gives us the feedback. This is a resource. We want it to be used. We want it to be consumed. We want it to be helpful. So give us the feedback if it is helpful and uh, promote it if it was. So thank you for joining us on this episode of the Enemies Within the Church podcast. <sighs> I hope you enjoy the effort that I put into this. And remember, don't go woke. Don't go woke.